Happy Saturday. Welcome to Virtual Veg Fest Live. Uh, pretty excited today. I just want to say, like, I'm excited probably for all the talks. I mean, so, I mean, when I say I'm excited, I'm not just saying it for the sake of like, oh, here I am again. But really, some incredible people are coming on for these Virtual Veg Fest Live talks. And I'm excited because that means I get to spend time with people that I absolutely adore, love, care about. And then you get to be part of that too. So let's say thank you to Sun Warrior for sponsoring our Virtual Veg Fest Live talks. And of course, you can get the 25% off using our code scrolling on the bottom of the screen. You can also find that link on our social media plant-based network thank you to them for being our partner in this even existing which is awesome now our talk today is with afton hughes from the pig preserve which we've just spent the last 30 minutes catching up so it's really cool so you get to join in on learning all about her and what she does and let's see i don't know if there's anything else i want to say to begin so afton that's right afton's like pretty amazing the pig preserve has a significant number of pigs that they've saved and they live their sanctuary there. And she's the executive director and she does everything. She helps out other refuge refuges. She, they need fundraising. <laughs> and you know, I'm all about making sure that everyone knows that they should donate or not should, you could, it would be nice if you donated to all these sanctuaries that are suffering because of COVID. But I'm gonna bring Afton on and I want her to share with you who she is. And remember that you can comment, you can ask questions. And I don't know where my comment screen went, but I will find it when, as I pull Afton on. Let me see. Do, do. Hey, Afton. Hey. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for having me. So glad that you're here and that we get to talk about you and the pig preserve. And I'd love for you to share with people that are watching, who are you, what is the pig preserve? And then we'll just, you know, go from there. Yeah, so um, Afton Hughes, I'm the executive director of the pig preserve in Tennessee. We are um, a large pig sanctuary. We have uh, right now 166 uh, rescued pigs that live with us. We have a good population of large farm pigs, all different breeds, ages, um, even sizes, uh, but they're the big guys. They are usually between 500 and you know 1100 pounds, give or take. Um, and then we've got a handful of miniature pigs and we have um, also some feral pigs that live with us as well. Oh, wow, feral pigs. What's mm -hmm. a feral pig? So that would be like a wild boar. Um, if you're from, uh, well, I think at this point they're they're in most states, but um, I know Tennessee, North Carolina, Florida, Texas, um, all have a pretty good size population of the wild boars, and so they are uh, really misunderstood creatures, actually, and they um, they're just as sweet, just as smart. Um, just as affectionate actually when they know that they're safe and have a, a family and a home and um, all the things that they need are there. So uh, the ones that we do have, of course, were not taken from the wild. These are rescues that have been largely either uh, taken in by other sanctuaries or petting zoos that have gone under or closed. So those have had to find somewhere uh, safe to go. They're not releasable, of course. And then um, we have a handful as well that were orphaned or uh, picked up by animal control for various reasons. Maybe they were illegal pets or um, seized by wildlife resources, those kind of things. So these are wild animals that wouldn't have anywhere else to go to be safe. Okay, that's awesome. I mean, you see those like in, in movies more so than you see mm -hmm. in real life, but yeah, that's really cool that they have a place too, because that's incredibly important. Afton, what's your background? Um, I've been in rescue a little over 10 years. I started um, in a little town called Maryville, Tennessee with um, the local Humane Society there and did, uh, gosh, several years, uh, started just scoop and poop like the best of us and um, uh, just, you know, cleaning kennels, walking dogs, um, doing all that good stuff. We targeted um, local kill shelter and uh, my group successfully went uh we, we made that shelter uh, rather from uh, they were about 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent kill most months. And we took them to um, most months now, still now it's 99 to 100 percent safe. So that's where I started out was in um, no kill sheltering, working with and targeting kill shelters. 
Um, I've worked with a few shelters around um, that county to kind of uh, spread the formula that we use to get there so that other people can um, mimic those results and um, have had some success with that as well. And then um, somewhere along the way, I became a caseworker with children and took those children to a farm sanctuary to do therapeutic work and fell in love with farmed animals. And so it was a natural marriage, um, you know, since I already really believed in the no-kill movement to expand that out to all the animals. Um, it's really the only thing shocking to me at this point is why didn't I see it sooner? I think a lot of vegans say that. But um, yeah, so that, that first little volunteer experience with my kids, um, the first day that I met safe cows and chickens and pigs and goats, I was like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. So I went to a cookout. It happened to be the 4th of July um, of all the days to go do that. And I went home to a family cookout and didn't eat meat and then made the decision that day to go vegan. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been with the Pig Preserve three years. So um, found them. Rich is um, moving into retirement, and so he was looking for somebody to come in that could be his successor. And um, we started talks about three years ago, and it was a good, uh, seemed a good marriage of, you know, his skill set and my skill set to kind of make that happen and secure the safety of the sanctuary and moving forward. So I've been uh, with the Pig Preserve about three years. That's, that's incredible. What, what a great history to bring you to where you are. Now, let's talk about the pig preserve itself. Like how long has it been around? Let's talk about Rich. Go, let's hear. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we have been a nonprofit uh, for over 30 years, close to 35 now. Rich and Laura Hoyle started our sanctuary um, in Virginia where they lived at the time uh, all those years ago. In the 80s, uh, many pigs first became available as pets here, and they were considered an exotic pet. Um, I think we've all seen that pattern where something comes in and it's new and it's trendy and everybody wants one. So um, Laura really wanted a pet pig. And so at the time, the only place to get one would have been from a breeder. Of course, there weren't any here to have been rescued yet. So they did acquire one and they loved uh, Patty Murphy was that little pig's name. And they fell in love with her. And then they tried um, uh, pretty quickly to um, figure out the very best way to make her happy. Uh, because, again, they were new to the, the states. And so there wasn't a lot of information about, you know, this is the best way to keep pigs and this is what makes them happy. And um, in Vietnam, where they came from, they were raised for meat, uh, even the small pigs. So um, they really spent a lot of time with her and kind of watching her behavior compared to their dogs and just did she enjoy being outside, inside. And so then the friends who had also adopted pet pigs, who maybe it didn't work out well for, were like, hey, maybe you could take our pet pig too. And so that's how the rescue started. So they became the people who would take the pet pigs. And then they became a mini pig rescue. And then somewhere along the way, um, they were asked to rescue a couple of farm pigs. And they thought, well, why not? <laughs> you know. And then they fell in love with those big farm pigs. And uh, they decided to um, try to accommodate any pig that they could. And so that was kind of the beginning of the the farm sanctuary piece of what our, our puzzle became. And they, uh, they did that for a while in Virginia. They were there about 15 years and then they decided to look for more land and uh, land was very expensive uh, in the area they were in, in Virginia. So they started looking in other States and they looked in Kentucky and Tennessee quite a bit. And that's how they found um, the beautiful property that we're on in Fentress County. All right, sorry, I went on mute because <laughs> my dog started barking okay. and I started clapping to make her stop. So, yeah, that's that's incredible. How big is the property? So we're on almost 100 acres and um, we have kind of a rolling property. It has uh, several ponds. It, sorry, my camera's shaking. My dog's rolling around beside <laughs> beside of me. Um, I'm having the same problems that you're having. Uh, <laughs> everything's about them, they think. Um, true. So we have a rolling property. Uh, it's almost 100 acres. It is uh, about half and half wooded and half pasture. It has uh, several large ponds, uh, a couple of streams, lots of little springs um, that are all over the property, which is nice because the 
the uh, natural water sources are always available for the pigs um, and it's actually never been dry enough to dry all that up so they've, they've always been there so the pigs always have the ponds and um, they don't swim much in the winter of course but the rest of the year they they do um, go down and hang out and soak and swim in the, the ponds and uh, of course get a cool drink um, anytime they want to so that's been nice and they um, I think because of our setup, they do get a lot of exercise. We have the largest portion of the property is in one big perimeter fence. And so the the bulk of our population of pigs is just free within that acreage. And so they form their own social groups and they they spend time wherever they want to. Um, you know, they wake up whenever they want to. Um, they can go in and out of the barns as they want to. They, you know, have little fights like siblings would and move in with somebody else for a while and they'll move back in with their old family for a while. Um, but yeah, it's it's really unique in that it's set up more like a nature preserve. Um, we just happen to house pigs instead of, um, you know, wild animals, so to speak. We do have the, the wild feral pigs. But, uh, but yeah, it's um, visiting our place is sort of like going on a safari in Africa if you were doing that with pigs. That's really neat. <laughs> but, so what, what's my question going to be? There's over a hundred, 136, did you 166. say? 166. 166, okay, I was close. 166 of the pigs, all different sizes, living together. And you kind of touched on what their personalities are like. So mm -hmm. can you go into more of that? Because people don't really understand that pigs, one, as we know, are smarter than dogs. They're social creatures. They're not yep. dirty. They only roll in mud to keep cool, right? Yep. And you know, and they are very social, like you said. I mean, I you see it with cats and dogs. I mean, they get along yeah. like cats and dogs. <laughs> sometimes yeah. they love one another. Sometimes they hate one another. <laughs> yeah, they do. They have their own personalities and their own, um, really their own social structure. So the pigs that are more dominant um, definitely kind of are the leaders of different areas of the property. And they are the ones that the more submissive pigs look to for direction. Um even though they are very protected within our fences, we still have, um, you know, wildlife. We we try to live in harmony with the wildlife, uh, foxes, coyotes, bears, um, hawks, uh, snakes, any number of things like that. So if the, um, they're sort of the leaders, if they see or hear anything that they feel is a threat, they'll make certain noises and vocalize to their family. And they usually stand guard until their families moved out of that area. Um, so it's really cool to see them protect each other and, they're very loyal to each other. Um, they do, like I said, have little, you know, scuffles and spats over, you know, that was my apple or my spot at the trough or whatever they happen to be upset about that day. That was my fluffy hay. Um, but they do, they largely, um, you know, they treat each other like family uh, very much so. And they're, they're a little smarter than dogs. And so if you think about how close and how bonded um, your dogs get with each other and with you, um, it's just a little stronger than that because they have just a little more depth of, um, intelligence and, you know, cognitive ability. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been really neat to watch the pigs. Um, they teach us things, you know, every day, um, when they, when we have new pigs, um, or even as, as they age, like there's just all these different situations that pop up and watching them deal with life the way that it comes at them is very humbling. You know, if we do get a new pig in the, the pig usually approaches others with kind of like a, um, either I'm a big kid and I'm going to see how this works out and they'll kind of charge in and see what happens or they come out and they're like, I don't know, guys, can I sit at your lunch table? You know, and, <laughs> and they have different personalities like we do, but the herd responds, you know, kind of as a unit and they sort of try to say like, here are the rules, new kid, you know, and you can, you can see that happen and you can see the new kids find their place in that structure and, um, sort of fall in and feel safe and um, kind of get the hang of the routine. And then um, it's, it's just sort of an energy change. You can see when they come in from trauma and they're nervous or afraid or, you know, just jittery and just not really quite sure what's going to go on. Frantic even sometimes. Sometimes they follow us around like they're so afraid that they don't know if we're going to come back and feed them or if they're going to be able to get in a barn. Their, their energy can sometimes be very frantic. And then, you know, two, three, four, six days later, um, you know, they're just like, oh, hey, you guys again, is it dinner? You know, their, their energy is so much better. And they, they, the herd tells them, you know, that they're safe and the energy of the other pigs lets them know that they're, if they're not afraid, they don't need to be afraid either. Right. Um, they teach each other things too, of course, but, um, you know, it's one of the most kind of touching things that we see um, 
and there's lots of things, but, but the, um, if we do lose somebody, which of course happens in any sanctuary setting, we have elders, um, and sicknesses and injuries and things just, you know, like anybody would. And if we do lose somebody that you can, you can clearly see those social structures at play because if, um, like we lost, um, we had a girl named, uh, Henrietta that was rescued actually from, uh, it was what we call a museum farm. So it's uh, a place set up to look like a long ago time when they would have used animals a certain way on a small farm. So that's the best way I can describe it. But they usually have a kind of a smattering of each breed of animal that would be used for food or for their products. And then people come by and pet them and think, oh, how cool and la la la. But they're eventually killed, of course, for food, usually farm to table kind of things at those places. So these two pigs, Henrietta and Wilbur, um, were uh, rescued by a staff member who had cared for them when their time was up. She bought them from her employer, brought them to us. So they were very bonded and they set up camp with a couple of others. And when Henrietta, um, she just kind of didn't feel well a couple of days and she was older and we knew that probably her time was coming, but there, there really wasn't anything imminently wrong. She just, she kind of seemed a little off and she was sleeping more and her friends started sleeping around her and they actually spent the day before she passed they slept they made a square around her and they all her buddies slept beside of her until she passed away and so um you know they are so much more in tune with each other and more connected with the energy of each other you know than we are as people we're very self-absorbed compared to animals you know um but they they knew and they were there for her and they stayed with her until the end and then um, once her social group, her immediate social group had grieved and said goodbye and knew that she had passed, they moved away. And the social groups that lived closest to her that had also eaten with her and shared time with her came over next. And then they one at a time they say goodbye too. they don't crowd each other. Um, they don't. Um, it's just really unique. I mean, they, they really do like a few. It's like a funeral procession and they have a certain way that they do it. Uh, it's very respectful of the one who's passed and of each other during that process. That's heartwarming to hear. I mean, it's, I, I had one of my dogs die in my arms a few years ago and each, the other, the other dog and the cats all came over and, yeah. and like went like nose to nose with her almost. It was like heart wrenching actually, but yeah. you know, I, in a much smaller scale basis, I mean, what an incredible thing to experience and see and be a part of. Yeah, we try not to get too um, close to them because it almost feels a little invasive, like we want them to be able to do what they need to do. And then then we do our part um, and we do bury a, a good portion of the pigs that we lose on the property there because it's their home. Um, so they get to stay, you know, as, as long as they can. And um, occasionally we lose one at a vet, you know, or something like that. But the for the, the good portion of them are buried with us. Yeah, because I know like Linda Rapp Nelson has taken care of a few pigs and mm -hmm. like babies and, and mm -hmm. have brought them to the pig preserve. And I know that Linda went to visit. And at this point, Plutarch, I'm pretty sure it was Plutarch, right? Mm -hmm. was, was much older and yeah. was like up on the hill. Cause I remember she showed pictures of her. She told the story and she said like, she just went Plutarch and he came running and he totally remembered like, Hey, I lived oh, in your yeah. house. I peed on yeah. the floor like a racehorse because I watched yep. that. I was like, oh, my goodness, this dog is peeing on this wood floor. A dog yeah. pig is peeing on this yep. wood floor <laughs> for yeah, like no. five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the, they get big very fast. And I think um, I know of at least two, and, and there may have been more over the years that Linda helped with, but Plutarch and um, also Henry David Thoreau yes. were pulled um, by her from shelters. Um, and I don't know that we know how either of them ended up in the shelter, but they did end up in a, in a kill shelter. So she pulled both and fostered both while she found them a place to go. And um, it, I think they were, they didn't come in together. So it was two separate yep. things, but yep. yeah, they um, I've had a few in my house at this point too. And they are um, one of the most fun things you could ever do is foster a baby pig. And one of the messiest and like <laughs> I called Luna, my little tornado. And then uh, she's a little farm pig, little pink farm pig. Uh, like Plutarch and Henry David. And then uh, about a year later, I had little journey and she made Luna look Luna's tornado look like not a tornado, like a gentle breeze. <laughs> journey was off the chain. She, she's a little feral pig and she was totally different experience. Um, but they both just uh, like a puppy kicked up a few notches. Like the, they sleep really hard. 
then they're when they're rested, they zoom around like crazy until they're really tired again. So it's just like having a puppy. Um, yeah, but they're uh, they're super fun and super cute and very smart. Again, all those things and um, they learn routine really fast. Um, you know, they're super smart, but they do. You mentioned how much pee. I had uh, hardwood floors at my house as well when I had the two babies and um, different times. But you, you pretty much have to walk around behind them with a mop. That's just. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was, you just you're just sitting on the bed and you're like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't stop it doesn't okay no. I, I, i've got a cat coming so <laughs> here we go there's oh. Morgan's tail okay <laughs> it's probably the best place for her unless she might climb up on my shoulders but that's okay everyone watching probably loves animals so <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. yeah so i mean going back stepping back a sec so three years ago you joined the pig preserve you're the executive director and do you have any idea like when this will be you, you'll, you know, take it over? Yeah, so um, some parts of this story are very similar to sanctuaries all over the place. Um, Rich and Laura started a sanctuary on their own property uh, with their own house and their own money and then grew it into an organization. And so that's that's pretty standard. That's how most people get any kind of animal rescue started. And then... Um, somewhere along the line, you know, you have a board and you build those pieces up and you try to come up with a transition plan for your retirement. And so that's where they were a few years ago. And so there are some financial pieces of that that we're still piecing together and uh, just some logistical things that, that have to be worked out for that transition to be complete so that they can retire. And, um, you know, I'm not sure where they'll end up. They've talked about the beach and they've talked about different things, but um, I know that uh, they've really put their time in, uh, you know, rescuing and saving lives and teaching other sanctuaries, especially um, all the things that they've learned. You know, they have at this point 35 years of pig experience, and that's more than most vets have. You know, mm -hmm. um, they've seen almost everything. They've seen little bits of, I would say, everything. Um, and yeah, we uh, we get calls, I would say, at least once a week from other sanctuaries that are seeking um, just a second opinion or guidance on behavior or medical things. Um, medicines even. Um, Rich and Laura both worked as EMTs uh, in careers past, and so they have sort of a vast knowledge of um, the human body and human anatomy, and we're actually very similar to pigs in that way. So a lot of um, procedures and medicines and um, diagnostics work. Uh, there's a lot of overlap there, and there isn't a lot of research, official research on those things, um, you know, because pigs aren't allowed to live until they're old. And so the farm pigs, you know, as they get old, they develop a lot of the same, you know, illnesses and ailments as humans do. We had a, um, a girl that had a heart attack um, oh. and she was, yep. And that's, you know, in a traditional farm setting, if she had happened to still be useful to a farmer she might have been alive at her age but it's unlikely she would have been still producing babies so she would have died long before she would have been killed long before she would have had a heart attack you know and in um you know a, a large-scale factory farm i mean there's just no way if, if they had found her having any kind of attack or or dead of course it would have been a non-issue they wouldn't have tried to figure out what happened or help her so yeah there just isn't a lot of research on those those things and you know, we, we don't have normal protocols with most of the vets for things like that. I would say any of the vets almost uh, in the country, just there's no protocol for that. You can't call, you know, just any random vet up and say, hey, I've got a, you know, 800 pound pig that just had a heart attack. What can we do? Because they don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't know how to help you. Um, and there isn't, there really isn't even a, a, like a diagram that tells you what, how much of each med you would use for that kind of stuff again, because it's just not you, we, people don't treat it. So we did, um, with our vet, came up with a treatment plan for her that was essentially what you would do for a human. Um, she did survive the heart attack, and we did um, nitroglycerin patches on her okay. to kind of give her some comfort care um, while she was recovering, and it, it did work. So we had some a little more time with her um, after that heart attack. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's all these things that have happened and that he's seen and tried and done, and, um, you know, I've been very lucky to – be able to watch um, and learn and, and, you know, just let them mentor me through a lot of those things. But, um, you know, part, part of that transition too, it was, was their intention uh, for it to be sort of a gradual transition from, from them to someone new. 
so that they would be able to pass as much of that on as they could. And um, and like I said, we're we're lucky that they do spend a lot of time with other sanctuaries and other you know pet pig owners even. Um, which and there's more of those every day, which is also an amazing part of the the movement to see um, families you know who have a little bit of acreage like you know maybe we could do two or three or four pet pigs that are a thousand pounds you know and it sounds silly to say it that way but I mean people have horses and they keep them as pets and they're huge and expensive you know it's not that different. Right, right, it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, just, yeah. just different size. Oh, yeah. we, we got some comments, which is which is great. My dogs are coming in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're hi, Tony. Like, they're whining. They're whining outside. I love the pig reserve and you. That which is incredible. And of course, Evan's watching from Cotton Branch. You know, I'll hit so, Evan. <laughs> which is really cool. So, oh, where's where's that? Okay, so let's talk about current times. Right. Yeah. Which, which is which is really important because with the impact of COVID, how has that affected the pig preserve? It's affected everybody negatively, I think, um, in almost all the ways. Uh, our normal day to day things are getting done because, you know, we're a small staff anyway, and uh, we are easily able to social distance in almost every situation we're in on the farm. Um, and so that, you know, the work is getting done and the pigs are taken care of and, and those daily things that we do every day are still getting done. And, and a lot of the things that I do are administrative. And so those are still getting done as well, of course. But the um, the part, a big part of our activism and a big part of being in the larger movement is sharing, you know, what it's really like to be there and sharing the, the real magic of the animals with people. And that is definitely best done in person. Um, we are trying, I think everyone in the, in the sanctuary community is trying our hardest to engage people in different and more creative ways um, to keep that kind of that magic alive so that people stay interested and engaged in what we're doing and, and in the rescues and in saving lives and in creating long-term quality care situations for these animals. Um, but it is, it's definitely hit, um, you know, all of us in the pocketbooks. Um, I think that's pretty true across the board. People that are struggling that, you know, we're, we're able to make small donations monthly. A lot of those folks have had to pull out and, and none of us are upset with those people. You know, we're all, we're all suffering a little bit, um, especially in the beginning when so many people lost their jobs. So, um, you know, I hope that by the end of this year and the year end giving and, um, you know, on into next year that we all start to recover a little bit and, and times are a little easier for all of us, but it has been a challenging year. And, um, you know, the people who, who could still give, we're very grateful for every single dollar. Um, you know, the pigs are, um, they're not cheap. Right. <laughs> um, and they're worth every penny that we put into their care. Um, but we do have a lot of them and they, uh, they do require a lot of care. So we, um, we started a sponsorship drive um, that we're in the middle of now. And we have uh, featured each individual pig with their story and pictures and um, to kind of get where we're trying to get for our goal at the end of the campaign is to get two sponsors for every pig. And if we get two for every pig, that's uh, $50 a month per pig. And that does cover like kind of their basic care. That's feed and water and kind of anything that it would take to kind of keep them up for the month. So um, that's barring emergencies or major maintenance at the sanctuary, major vet bills and those things. But that really does help um, us create a budgetable amount of income that we can just count on to take care of basic needs for the pigs and COVID has kind of pushed us into you know like i said ways to try to get creative to just generate a little extra so well it's not extra to, to make up the difference really right. um so that's what we're doing but um people have been really great we've got some really um really special new folks that have found connections with pigs that they um that they felt drawn to and um, we're, we're working our way through that. So my hope is that uh, by the end of the year, we'll have enough uh, new people, new sponsors to cover each pig twice. And that is, um, that will really go a long way to help us make up the difference. Yeah. How does someone become a sponsor? There are links on our website. Um, there are links uh, throughout our social media because we're featuring it a lot lately. 
Um, but we have, uh, we're on Linktree. You can go to Linktree to um, see the Venmo and the PayPal and all the different ways you can donate. You can sign up any way that you want to. Um, but if you want to sign up on the, um, the official sponsorship campaign is on the website and we have um, everybody's profiles there. You would just click on the pig that you want to sponsor and then um, it will go directly to that pig and send us an email so that we will have you signed up for your quarterly updates and pictures. And um, we'll send other freebies out throughout the year, too, for our sponsor folks. And it's the, pig, it's the pigpreserve.org, right? Yep. Pig, okay. It's just uh, www.thepigpreserve.org. Okay, awesome. I'm going to add that to the broadcast. Thank you. <laughs> no link problem. tree is um, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E backslash the pig preserve. Okay. A little slower. Okay. <laughs> N-K. <laughs> link linktr.ee .ee. .ee. backslash the pig preserve okay so linktr.ee backslash the pig preserve okay yeah for thank you details no no problem we'll get that into the comments and as soon as that shows up we'll put it on the screen as well yeah which it's just there it goes i'm like where are you come on <laughs> there we go so that's another place that you can go to which yeah. is you know it's link tree but it's not like the way mm -hmm. i wrote it <laughs> you're good <laughs> yeah no it's incredibly important to support the sanctuaries because i mean yeah i have a cat in my lap you have a dog next to you well you know my dogs were let in while we were doing this and dogs and cats are like the the feel good i'll throw money easily mm -hmm. you know the dog and cat rescues are making six figures plus in donations pretty much easily and yeah so are they suffering because of covid yes they are too but it's more relatable for most people yeah it's, it's the farm animals that and we've discussed this when evan was on we discussed this it's the farm animals that people don't have that warm and fuzzy connection outside of it being on their plate so, mm -hmm. and once you get that, you don't want that on your plate, and then you have to then go meet a pig or a cow or chicken or rooster or a duck, a hen, whatever animal it is. And, and then you kind of go, oh my gosh, I can rub this pig's belly. And, mm -hmm. and he'll nudge me to keep rubbing his belly <laughs> because they like their bellies rubbed because <laughs> like my dog does. And then you develop that connection, and then you're like, "Whoa, we're look at this one." Okay, especially if you're if you're not already like plant based or vegan, mm -hmm. and then you kind of go, "Maybe I shouldn't be eating this animal." I mean, that that's what did it for me. I mean, I think there's like you said, the the an farm animal sanctuaries. I mean, there there are plenty of them, but there are definitely not nearly as many as there are dog and cat rescues in our country and in the world, I would argue as well. But it is challenging for people to be like, well, this pig is cute and I'm going to push it beyond that. You know, they, they can put the food piece over here and they can put that this is a cute cartoon pig or I've got a, you know, purse with a cute cow on it or whatever um but they they can compartmentalize all those things and and then still ignore the things that they know are true you know um and i don't like i said the only thing i regret is just not realizing it sooner and i think there were little pieces of time where i thought you know there has to be some other way we could do this but i didn't know anybody who was vegan for a very long time and, and nobody sort of took me to ever meet farm animals sorry <laughs> <laughs> my dog's pawing at the computer um, so I just didn't know where to go for that information and so for me now that I'm heavily obviously involved in the sanctuary world it is it was the pivotal piece for me you know I had seen the activism footage I had seen the HSUS commercials and the undercover PETA footage and gotten the flyers in the mail and and turned my head away from many an email you know with videos that I just couldn't stomach and and it it mattered to me and those things became a part of who I am I can still remember bits and pieces of almost all those video video clips that I've seen but it took me meeting a happy farmed animal and understanding that they are multi-layered like us and that like you said they they want belly rubs and they have friends and they are 
engaged in their world and their life and that they have, you know, just as much right to have a life full of love and comfort and free of suffering as our dogs and cats are. And it took me meeting them in person for that to happen. And so a big part of my investment in this, this piece of the larger animal welfare and rights movement would be, you know, I would argue that sanctuaries made me vegan, you know, and I, and I had access to some of that other stuff and it wasn't quite enough for me. It was too scary, you know, um, and it was overwhelming. And so I know that uh, many people that have visited sanctuaries decide that that's the piece you know, that, that pushes them there. They've done it for, and a lot of them can give you an animal's name. You know, like you said, it's a chicken or it's, it's this or that. And we actually have a pig named Puppy. Um, and that's why she's named Puppy. Uh, her student, uh, she was a, an FFA pig and her student uh, didn't have a name for her for a little while. And the more she got to know her at school, she reminded her of a puppy following her around and learning tricks and doing all those things. And um, so she, the student herself called me and said, at the end of the semester, of course, when that, the, you know, the end of the thing is there. And she says, um, you know, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't, I don't really want to do this. I wanted to be a vet and I got into this program and, you know, my pig's name is puppy and I would really like to find her somewhere to go. And, you know, we always spend time with any kid, especially that calls um, student and, and try to help them make those connections. And we try to always find a place for those pigs to go. A lot of the time we're able to say yes. Um, you know, sometimes we have to use other sanctuaries and network to find somewhere for them to go. But the important thing in those situations for me is that that kid is is almost there. And so if you can help them find safety for that animal, you're not just getting them out of a bad situation. You're also telling them that there is a place in the world for those animals to be and exist that isn't as a commodity or as an object or as a meal or as a dollar, you know, Um and I think telling them no sends them exactly the opposite message the first time. Now, part of our message, too, for those kids, we always tell them at the end of the the negotiations about getting them there and all of that, we always tell them that, that we will not accept another animal from them. So, you know, you have, as a person, gotten uncomfortable in this situation because you know it's the wrong thing. And we very much honor and respect that. If you choose to stay engaged in these farming programs, know that we will not say yes next time. Right. We've never had a kid call us twice. Oh, that's good. I mean, mm -hmm. and they made the connection. That's why they called you in the first place. Yeah. Right? Yep. I mean, and, and what goes from there, you know, it, it depends what happens from there because they are still kids, but you've that seed is planted right. to help them move forward, maybe living a more humane life by not eating the animals and actually associating the pigs and the chickens and the cows and, and whichever mm -hmm. animals as as not an it, right? The commodity, mm -hmm. but as a sentient being. Let's see what Evan has to say. Uh, the knowledge and help that the Pig Reserve gives to the public and sanctuaries across the country is amazing. Please donate and give if you're able, which is fantastic coming from somebody who also needs you to donate and give if you're able. <laughs> yeah, thank right? you, Evan, we love you too. Yeah, Evan, you're awesome. So, I mean, he gets it. I mean, I, I, I have no problem asking for money for all of you. So <laughs> that's why I want to have you on. So that I know, and you know, what's funny is, and having been in the dog and cat world for so long too, it, and there were so many dog and cat rescues, it is very competitive. And, um, you know, there would be several in, not just in my area, but all over the country, there are several in a county sometimes, you know, competing for resources and homes and all of those things. And one of the nice things about the farm sanctuary community that I found to be slightly different from that other world is there aren't so many of us that it feels that way. And I do feel like there's a lot of support and love for each other. And I think, you know, anybody doing a good job that asks for help, we all try to help, um, you know, and, and if you're not doing a good job even, and you need to know what you need to do better, like I feel like people reach out a lot for help and we help. Um, you know, there are uh, sanctuary pages where we talk about placement and, you know, um, this is a new thing I've never seen. They may have good solutions. And um, I feel like it's it's really been a joy to be a part of something where, you know, it's almost like a little pep rally every time we do get together and have any kind of camaraderie or, you know, good conversations. We celebrate each other's victories. Um, you know, it's it's a hard thing that we've all taken on. It's emotional. It's 
Um, you know, there's compassion fatigue all the way around. And I think we all kind of ride that roller coaster through good times and bad times. There's a lot of death. You lose a lot of, um, you know, animals that you try for or that uh, you get calls about and can't take or that don't call you back when you find a place for them to go and you don't know what happens to them. You know, yeah. um, a lot of our day is full of uncertainty and, um, you know, trauma. And even if it's not direct, it's indirect trauma a lot of the time because you're just soaking up the stories of the people you're taking care of, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult. And I think lifting each other up and making everybody stronger, um, leaders and stronger fundraisers and stronger, um, individuals just so we can carry the burden. Well, um, is a really important part of what we're all doing. Very well said. Thank you for, you know, it's, a, you're right. It, it's, it's hard. And I know a lot of you and it, I've obviously been to sanctuaries and, this this year i mean you we're fundraising for you outside of a pandemic <laughs> and then mm -hmm. you know with the pandemic with people with limited funds yeah it's even more important to fundraise because one thing i'm mm -hmm. not sure if we spoke about is that the visitors to the preserve are way down because of yeah. covid and that's yeah, well, that's the integral part of like helping someone one education wise to recognize that you know, they're sentient beings and not it's, and here's the reason why you don't want to eat them, but financially too. Yeah. And I mean, I think you, you said it well there. I mean, it is, it is critical to, to our sustainability and our growth to encourage, um, you know, new people to visit and be a part of what we're doing. And it is part of the education piece that we do. It's part of the fundraising piece because really the animals, I mean, and we, we, we say all the time, you know, it's, uh, everything we do is for the animals. We just work here. You know, if, um, when people visit, we don't really have to do anything, um, except, you know, we drive them around and they see the animals and they, we are constantly amazed at the connections that the animals choose to make with people who visit because it's, we have a few pigs that are, we call them greeters and they always come over for new people. They're like, Hey, new, new person, new belly rub, you know, they're all excited. <laughs> and then we have some that are more standoffish or maybe don't love a crowd or don't love, you know, whatever it is that, that they don't enjoy as much. But sometimes there's a person in that group and, and a pig who doesn't usually come over, will come over to that person. And, and there's some kind of energetic connection that they have that, you know, one of them needed something from the other person and, and we couldn't have predicted or set that up. You know, the pigs do all of that. And then when they leave, I always ask people who their favorite animal was. And we get such a wide variety of answers, you know, which I love because I love them all individually, too. You know, I have, um, you know, some that I spend more time with just because they're more connected to me for whatever reason and vice versa. But we love them all and I love all of their stories and all of their personalities and um, they all bring something different to people's experience. Mm -hmm. And so when people do visit, the animals are the ones who teach them, you know, we matter and that we have personalities and that we are worth saving and we are worth keeping safe for the duration of our lifetime. And we are worth the donation. You know, I don't have to be a good salesperson. I just have to get people there. Right, exactly. Now that we can't get people there, we have to, you have to go into a more marketing thing, which is, you know, the sponsorship for the animals and the pictures mm -hmm. and whatever else you can do virtually to get people involved and interested mm -hmm. as best as you, as best as you can. And of course, that is also as much as it's not a competition, it's, it's all of you having to do similar things, mm -hmm. but in your own way and yeah. how you're going to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there, I mean, there are plenty of resources to go around. I mean, I think it's important and I think everybody, you know, that I work with at least it does a really good job of remembering that it's not a competition, you know, if, well, and Cotton Branch, like Evan's on here, they did that huge rescue, you know, that we unfortunately had our hands full and, and couldn't really do much to help them at all, which we hated, but, um, you know, we tried to promote adoption for those pigs. We, we still send people that way that, that reach out to us from their area to try to get them over to, to do adoptions or go visit. Um, you know, we, we do, um, very much feel a part of that larger network. And, you know, one of the things I tell new sanctuaries, cause we do get those calls a lot too, you know, Hey, I want to start a sanctuary or, Hey, I want to, um, you know, I've got a piece of property. I want to adopt some pigs or whatever it is that they're trying to do. Like we get those, those new people calls a lot and we always try to get them to volunteer a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot <laughs> before they take something like that on. And then the other thing you know, that we do is, is try to direct them to anybody in their area that's good at what they do. And so 
we try to stay connected to to those other rescues and, and toggle not only pigs that need help and other species that need help, because of course we work with that too and, and help with that too, um, but to try to encourage, you know, maybe somebody new who doesn't have a big knowledge base or skill base for doing that work, maybe they would be more useful as a full-time volunteer for somebody like Cotton Branch or for us if it's somebody else or whatever. And then if they do decide to do their own thing, then great, you know, we'll help them do whatever they need to do. But there's plenty of, um, plenty of need and, you know, there are animals all over the country that we're all working on as the community. And I try to remind those new folks, too, because it's easy to get in. And, well, I've got, you know, 50 acres and it's brand new and I'm going to fill it up. And it's easy to say yes over and over and over again. <laughs> and <laughs> and I always try to remind people, and, it, and it's, a, it's something I have to tell myself all the time because we get messages literally every single day. Help me, help me, help me. Yep. Every single animal that that you're asked to help with isn't on your plate. It's on the community's plate, you know, and our collective resources are best used, you know, trying to stay as local as we can to do each rescue and then kind of branching out from there to find placement in, in other areas because the collective resources to do transport and move them and, you know, network them and, and what all the pieces that have to go into that. Um, and so working together is really the best use of the collective resources to not just each individual rescues. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, yeah, there's, you know, you said something earlier, like when they started 30 years ago, that pigs were like that new found novelty, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, like purple rabbits or something, right? Yeah. For Easter. And that they you had to go to a breeder. And you, I kind of chuckled when you said that because you don't no no breeder. <laughs> like there are so many pigs that need homes yeah right now yeah. that and it's a big it's a big part of our education program too i mean we have we get a lot of calls like hey i want to adopt a mini pig and and before i'm like okay do that um we usually try to get them to visit because i want them to see a the spectrum of size from somebody who's like rc cola who happens to be a small adult pig he's just a little bit smaller than a regular size average you know, miniature pig. And then we have somebody who, you know, was rescued as a little bitty, you know, little bitty guy. And he's about 500 pounds. He's a humongous pot belly pig. He's big boned. He's tall. He's a big pig. And he was, was actually found in the road. So we don't know his genetic history, but he's just a big pot belly. And there's no promise, you know, of, from one end of that spectrum to the other. And you have to be prepared for anything in between. Um, and then, too, we want them to see, you know, what their behaviors are like in groups and, and, you know, that some of them like to be pet and rubbed and some may not. And there's also no guarantee that you get a cuddle bug or a couch potato or, you know, they ha they're different, just like dogs, um, you know, that you, you could adopt a couch potato or you could adopt somebody that really needs lots of stimulation, exercise and, and intellectual, you know, games and things to be happy with you. Um, and so, yeah, we, we like for people to come out and learn anything they need to learn, um, you know, about any of that stuff for sure. And then um, we do a lot of pet retention, um, you know, and that's something that is very important to me. Just, I mean, historically in my rescue career, we did so much of that with the goal of keeping dogs and cats out of the shelter, because when the shelter is full, you know what that means. And so the less intake you have, the less risk there is that somebody's going to euthanize an animal. And so... And with pigs, honestly, they're in shelters too now, and so it's it's really no different for them uh, at this point in the ball game. They've kind of been rolled into that same category where there are so many that they're spilling into shelters, and shelters aren't really trained or equipped to, to handle them properly. Um, but yeah, we um, we get calls all the time. I actually got a message yesterday from uh, Young Williams Animal Shelter in Knoxville. They have two two that they asked for help with. So it's. Um, you know, it, it is a problem that I think the community is hitting from all angles. We're hitting it from spay neuter. We're hitting it from pet retention. You know, a lot of the problems with pet pigs are um, we can almost always in the first couple of minutes tell if it's that the pig's not neutered or spayed, if the pig doesn't have a friend, if it's getting out of the fencing. Those are like the top three things. Mm -hmm. And we can usually, if we can get people to look at it from to take more than just a second to come up with a plan that'll get them not through the day, but through the next month. And if I can just get them to buy me that much time to do a neuter and maybe repair the fence and do the couple of things, a lot of those folks will keep their animals. 
you know, and then that's an animal that didn't go into, again, that collective network that we're all part of, and it didn't fill up a space in a rescue. Right. Yeah. And that, that's, that's fantastic, because that's what some people need, and sometimes you just don't know. It's like someone with a cat that's peeing outside the litter box. Well, have you gone to the mm-hmm. vet? It might be urinary tract mm-hmm. infection. It's not that the cat's like, or, yeah. or the cat could be acting out because <laughs> cats do that. Yeah. But they're most likely there's probably something wrong and that's their way of telling you something's wrong. Yeah. And you yeah. go and fix the problem and then now everything's better and you can you know keep everyone at home and not fill up shelters with animals mm-hmm. that you promise to take care of for their lives. Yeah. That's another whole piece. We try not to, to lay on the guilt too much with folks, but just enough to to try to get them to remember that commitment that they've made. Um, you know, and, and there's always going to be situations where things are not going to work out. You know, right. um, you know, you, you've lost your home and and we actually just had to take um, we've got two coming back to us that adopted out from us. Um, and of course, we'll always honor, you know, any anybody that came from our place. But um, they've lost their home due to, um, you know, income from covid loss. And so. You know, I'm, I'm, what am I going to do? Tell them to live in their car with their pigs? <laughs> you know, that's not the <laughs> compassionate way to handle that situation. And so, you know, we'll hang on to them until they get back on their feet and they will, um, you know, and, and then they'll go back. And so, um, you know, again, that's pet retention is part of it. You know, it's, it's part of, um, it's almost like we're a resource for the animals. And that's definitely the first and foremost thing that we need to be good at. But the secondary part of that, that's, <clears throat> that's really important too, is that we need to be good with people. Um, you know, and we need to take care of the people too, because people are the solution to everything that we're dealing with. It's a problem. They're the solution to adoption. They provide foster homes. They provide all of the donations that make everything run. Um, every bit of vet care, every bit of medicine, every bit of, um, fencing and housing and, um, transport costs and, you know, all of it, um, people drive the, the safety of the animals, you know, and, and their long-term care. And so it's easy to get put out with the public, but they're also the answer, you know, right. there's things that they are not educated on or, or maybe not doing a great job at sometimes, but um, every educated person that you send back out there does a better job the next time. Right. Especially if they, if they make the decision to want to tell every single person that they know why they made their decision. Yep. Right. And that's, that's the power. That's the power of the seeds that you plant and the communication and the, the, the building of a community for animals and for humans to coincide. And you're right. You need humans, you need people to help support what you're doing so that you can continue what you're doing because it's a yeah. nonprofit. You, you run a nonprofit because you look for help from the community. Yeah. And it's, I mean, legally the nonprofits of the world belong to the people. They don't belong to me or rich or, you know, any, any sanctuary director or leadership person. They don't, they don't belong to us. They belong to the people. Um, you know, and, and I think that everything we do should be sort of in keeping that in mind, you know, it's, it's a service that we provide again to the animals and the people of our communities. And then too, you know, I think, um, that is my dog snoring. I'm so sorry. Awesome. <laughs> <If you're... laughs> um, but yeah, we, it's, a, it's, I feel like we are all pieces of a very large puzzle and we're all pulling in, in theory, pulling our weight a little bit. And so the, the greater shift that we're all part of is, is moving together because we're all doing bits and pieces of it. Um, you know, and that's that same thing I was talking about earlier. Like the whole thing's not on anybody's plate, you know, as a collective whole, we're all pulling this thing into a new place you know, and out of this antiquated old way of thinking and doing things and and the sheltering systems the same way. I think everybody's waking up in a different way. And I think we're starting to question and look at, you know, the traditional ways that we were taught to look and think at all of these pieces. And those questions are really good, you know, and I think it's the, those of us that are sort of in that zone where we have put the pieces and and the connections together, you know, we have to be, kind and we have to be compassionate to people who are on that journey to get to the other side because you know so many of us had a harder time because there wasn't anybody there saying you know let me take you out to eat and let me take you to the grocery store and let me take you to meet a cow that's safe and let me talk to you more about these things because if you don't have any guidance it takes you longer it's harder and it's so much easier to quit you know and if you are supporting people, then they are so much more likely to get it and follow through and, and get there quicker. And then, like you said, share their story with other people as soon as they get there. Because when you're on the other side, 
it's exciting. You know, I'm, I'm not a super skinny vegan and that's okay with me, <laughs> but you know, I feel so much better than I ever felt before. And it's, it's physical and it's mental and it's psychological, you know, it's, it's all those things. Um, because I, I finally got to a place where all everything made sense. You know, um, I don't sit down anymore. And I used to, you know, let's say I went and got a sandwich somewhere and there was a tiny bit of gristle or something in it. I wouldn't eat meat for a week after that because it completely and totally weirded me out. And I was like, I don't, why am I eating this? You know, but I was doing that by myself and there wasn't anybody saying, Hey, if you don't want to eat that, here's a seitan nugget. Right. <laughs> it wasn't a thing that was easy for me to find in my circles, you know? And so I just sort of struggled through it. And, and so many of, of the people that are vegan now, I'm sure have, you know, even longer ago stories than that. And, and I can't imagine how people did it 30 and 40 years ago. I mean, you know, hats off to those folks because that, that was a challenge, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's the best thing I ever did. And I don't know any vegans that would say otherwise. Uh, it's just, you know, it's for the animals and it's, mm -hmm. you feel like all the decisions you're making make sense. Finally. You found your piece to your puzzle. Yeah. Well, I'm so proud of you. Because I mean, you're, you're truly incredible. And I mean, what, what you exude and what you share, the life that you live, the steps that you take all are all encompassed in you. Right. And, and you're just, you're so valuable to the community. And that's, well, yeah. I'm, I'm lucky to be a part of it. I'm, I'm lucky every day. Um, and I definitely don't take for granted that, you know, the, it was a combination of things that led me down this journey. And, and some of those things were super amazing, fun, fantastic bits and pieces. And some of them were traumatic things, you know, that sort of drove me one way or the other to get from one end of that spectrum, you know, 10 years ago when I had no idea what this kind of life would be like <laughs> to being here now. Um, and it is, uh, you know, anytime we hire a caregiver or, you know, again, train a new volunteer who wants to do this for a living at some point, you know, it's a lifestyle. It's not a job. Um, it's, it, and I can't, I can't stress that enough to people who may not know, but it's, um, it, it changes everything. It really does. And it, I mean, it's the best thing I've ever done. Obviously I wouldn't, I can't imagine doing anything else now. Um, and, it, and in some ways it is this magical dream bubble of sunshine and rainbows and all the things that are wonderful and magical in the world, but that's all the animals, you know, that, that's not me. That's not the, the people that are involved in it. Really. That's the animals. We just are lucky to live in the same world that they live in. That's true. That's really, really true. Well, Afton, I mean, thank you so much for joining us today. I mean, it's important for me to reach out to as many people as possible who are doing similar things to what you're doing. And I try to get at least one sanctuary on once a month at a minimum. And I just kind of like roll through my head as to like who I need to reach out to, to say, when can you do this? And of course, like I'm booking like two months ahead. <laughs> well, two months, yeah. I'm, like I'm booking December now for, and it's October. So, I mean, I just kind of like scroll through my friends list sometimes and go, I need to talk. I do. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I start typing. Do you want to yeah. come to virtual veg fest live? <laughs> well, so. I mean, it's great that you're doing it. And, and we, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I know that the veg fests of the world are so important to us because we do tend to get like in our little world, we're in our bubble all the time because the animals need a lot. And so we're there and we're, you know, engaging with the public and we're taking care of the vets and we're, we're doing all the bits and pieces that it takes to run a sanctuary on a daily basis. And it's easy to um, kind of withdraw from the normal world, so to speak. And it's nice to go back out into the world and sit at a table and talk to people about what you do and meet new faces and, and new people, but also to be in a safe place where you're surrounded by so many people who are like you. And in a place where you can walk to any table and order something to eat. And, you know, VegFest is this magical Disneyland for, for us people, <laughs> right? Yeah, and so we've, yeah. we've really yeah. missed it. And so I'm grateful that you're finding ways uh, to stay connected with all of us. And I'm excited to see VegFest come back hard and heavy. Well, I don't think it's going to be hard and heavy. <laughs> I think it's going to be cautious and Asked. creative. 
<laughs> you know, and, and masked yeah. and social distanced yeah. and outside. So, and it, it does look like in Nashville will be the only event that I do this year, Full Veg Fest. I, I yeah. learned this week that Asheville will definitely be a 2021 event. So I haven't put that out there yet, but it's out there now if you're watching. So, yeah. so They Nash can come to Nashville. It's not that far. Right, Those exactly. Can Asheville yeah. can come to Nashville because yeah. I, I do I do promote it over that way as well because that's that's it for that's that's probably like the only full on veg fest that will exist in twenty twenty anywhere in the country. So Wow. Yeah, thank you, Tennessee. <laughs> I the just, volunteers right. Yeah, I just yeah, I was right. I just I just need kinda like the world to stay where it is right now ish yeah. and not and and not well you're a republican state <laughs> so i'm not really worried about it closing yeah <laughs> so i mean that that's a positive so <laughs> i mean i we will be cautious and of course if you're not understanding what we're talking about nashville veg fest is october 17th and 18th at the nashville fairgrounds the pig resort will be there on which day saturday or sunday um we will try to do both okay I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you to come both days. <laughs> so that's, that's fantastic. And that's, mm. that's the only veg fest. It's the one I needed to have happen this year, to be honest, out of all of them. Yeah. I've, but it's, it's the one that it, you know, Nashville, what an incredible community for the veg and Knoxville too, which is closer to you. Well, kind of closer. So yeah, you know, kind of, we, you know. we have volunteers. You and I talked earlier, but we, you know, we're in a small farming town, and so while people I think are interested and curious about what we do, that sort of really passionate crowd of people that kind of get all the pieces and really want to get in there and get their hands dirty and help with daily chores and help set at a table and help us talk to people and um, you know just sort of drive the thing more in the public part of what we do and, and also being involved physically at the sanctuary. Um, most of those folks um, that help us in that way are from Nashville, Knoxville and Chattanooga. Um, and we're really grateful for all three of those, you know, like I said, Tennessee's the volunteer state and, you know, rarely does anything happen in our state where people don't step up to help. And I've always been grateful to live here um, for that reason. But, um, you know, those folks are driving two hours to spend the day with us when they come and two hours back home when they're, when they're tired and worked, you know, all day. Yeah. So, we're really grateful for those folks. It's um, it's it's a different level of commitment when you're having to to be in, invested in our place and we're that far away from you. We're really grateful. And yeah, lucky. No. yeah, incredibly. I mean, thank you to all the people who volunteer at all the sanctuaries, especially the Pig Preserve. Especially when you, I'm typically you're in a place that's far away. Sanctuaries mm -hmm. don't tend to be like dropped right in the middle of like suburbia, <laughs> so yeah. you you have to travel. I mean, to go to to go to Piedmont, the refuge. It's an mm -hmm. hour from my house, right? They're closer to some people, but for me, yeah. it's a it's a nice hour drive, and yep. that's okay. I don't get there as often because it's an hour drive. But I mean, totally. I've got to get to Cotton Branch. I think that's like two and a half hours. You know, I've been to Cotton Branch, and Piedmont's visited us. So yeah, oh, there's lots of places fun. that I want to go, and lots of um, the other rescues that I want to visit. So. I think there's there's value to seeing what everybody does and everybody does it a little differently but all the same you know i think right. it's it's to, to learn from each other exactly um, that's why i go to all the veg fests yeah <laughs> I, yeah, well, I yeah that too and like i said that's that's pieces. where i have met most of the people that run other sanctuaries i've met them at conferences and veg fest um and it's so nice to put faces with people that you talk to online about things or that are in these groups with you or yeah it's a really veg fest rocks. I mean, I can't say that enough. It's been it's been a good time when I was just a person there for food, which is why I started going. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, kind of learning all the bits and pieces of, of all these other businesses. And it's it, there are more varied kinds of businesses there every year, which is amazing, you know, and just um people I wouldn't even think would have anything to do with it, but I know they're, you know, investment bankers and just all these different people that are vegan that are now promoting their business. My friend Callie's a virtual assistant and she focuses yeah. on vegan businesses, you know, and um, you know, how great that we can put our money and in our investment in other businesses who also share our values. Exactly. And thank you to Callie because she mm -hmm. donates her admin virtual assistant resources, skills, so that you can come to our events. 
Mm-hmm. So she, she barters. Does. She she helps us because <laughs> she's because she she takes yeah. care of you, which is great for us. I already said, Kate, okay, can you go post about this event? <laughs> you can you go post about yeah. Nashville? <laughs> yeah, she does a great job, and yes. um, you know she was brave enough to to change her whole career to support vegan businesses. And, you know, it it is growing. It's a growing field and a growing market, but that's not without its challenges on the front end, you know? So yeah, we try to to help her and support her as much as we can too. And she, I couldn't do this without her. I mean, she helps me a lot. I know because she totally donates her time to just be your admin and push you to do what you Uh, need to do. I know that she stays all over me. And if she didn't, (laughs) I would be, I would be in trouble. Um, she's, she's really the perfect, uh, She's the perfect virtual assistant. So, and I, but I know her in real life. I don't just know her virtually. But. Right. I, and we had dinner when I was in Knoxville. So I, I do know Callie yeah. in real life, too. Would you know, you know her, her in real life, life too. Do you know her, her website? Um, yep. She's the Veggie VA. That's it. Thank you. The Veggie VA.com mm-hmm. for a... Callie, Callie Mylan. Virtual assistant. Oh, and you can meet her in Nashville if you come. Because she'll she, be there. She's coming. Oh, I thought awesome. so. Well, that would be great. I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me if she's coming to to Nashville because, I mean, why not, right? <laughs> yeah, well, they were there last year too. So anybody that was there last year, um, she was there. Yes, yeah, yeah. so she she was in Knoxville. I mean, I think she attended Nashville last year. Oh, it was it was Knoxville. It was I'm Knoxville sorry. that she yeah. was. Yeah. She had her own booth, but she won't she won't have a booth yeah. in in Nashville. But maybe she'll come and help you guys. Okay. Okay. Good. We just, we just yeah. have to reach out to her. I guess we just signed her up. <laughs> guess yeah, what, Callie? <laughs> no pressure. It's all over the interweb. That's true. We just promoted you. So guess what? You get to come to Nashville and work the pig preserve booth and help us too. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much for joining us today and taking time away from the animals. Because I know, you, sure. I know you're incredibly busy in... I'm going to, uh, I have no idea. Once again, I, I never know who's who's going to be on next week, which I'll, I'll say once we say, oh, oh, good. Okay, I just left. <laughs> so I hope you have a great rest of your day and I appreciate you. And I, I don't know when I'll see you because I know you won't be in Nashville, but you know, no, um, 2021. Yeah, well, let's do this again sometime until then. Okay. I can, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> we could just right. do this and not be live. <laughs> and that's that's true too. I'm here, so it's been fun to get back together with you. And um, hopefully, some folks saw and enjoyed, and maybe we answered some questions people might have had about things. And um, you can always reach out to Helene or to me if you have further questions or think of things later. Um, our websites, the thepigpreserve.org. Um, we also are on all the social medias. We've got a Twitter and a Facebook and a YouTube and an Instagram and all those good things. So. So reach out and find us. And if you're in Tennessee and you want to come to the Nashville Veg Fest, you'll see us and Helene there. That would be fantastic. I don't think I added that to the broadcast. Okay, there we go. Oh, maybe I did already. Callie got some more love. <laughs> oh, good. Right. No, All no. right. Well, thank you, Helene. I'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. All right. Bye, Afton. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay. Oh, everyone, wasn't that just incredible? that Afton joined us and we learned all about the pig preserve and it's it's yeah I mean just incredible what they do and take care of the animals and and how selfless you have to be incredibly selfless to do that type of work because it's it's not easy it's hard hard work and emotional and physically draining and physically and emotionally draining so greatly appreciate so next week on Thursday Linda Watson is coming on she's a cookbook author and she's local to our community. She'll be on on Thursday the 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And then, let me see. Oh, I don't have somebody next weekend. Oh, isn't that strange? I think I might get a break. Oh, you know why? Because it's supposed to be a weekend where we're going to have like an Asheville event. But that's not happening. So I might book somebody for next weekend or I might just take a break. So Thursday we have a live talk. The weekend... Maybe not. But Tuesday, maybe I'll put Randy there. Randy from The Cows Come Home is going to join us on Tuesday for a brief 15-minute talk. But I actually might move Randy from Cows Come Home to next weekend and do a longer talk with her. Because our Pass the Buck campaign, if you donate a dollar or more to our Pass the Buck campaign, all that money goes to Cows Come Home. And you'll be entered to win a prize pack from Hodo Foods 
which would be pretty cool. So please do that. That's all over our social media now with correct links and a way to text us. And of course, the way I always finish out, hand in front of me, wear a mask, please, over your nose, under your chin. Really? Not like this, not like this, not like this, not like this, but it has to go over your nose and under your chin. It's incredibly important for it to be effective. I, there's nothing more <laughs> obvious about the effectiveness of masks than what's going on in our country right now. And then please vote. I can't impress upon you more than anything how important it is to vote, to register to vote if you're not. Some states allow you to do that during during early voting. Some states have their time limits. Go find out what that is. If you're not registered to vote, please do it. And please, 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 I beg of you. It has never been more important in our lifetimes in any election than this one to vote. Stay safe, social distance. I'll see you next week. Have a great rest of your weekend and thank you.